afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Zahio Kellig. I'm a former Director General here, and I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this event with the Chief Justice. Um, I have to say, Chief Justice, it's a great honour for us to have the Chief Justice in this room. Uh, you're not the first, and hopefully you won't be the last. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we're at a stage, I think, with Brexit where really nobody can foretell what's going to happen. But for us in particular in Ireland, uh, there is an issue, uh, which is that when the British leave, and I think it is most likely that the British will leave, when the British leave, we will actually be the, the most important member state in the European Union uh, under the common law. Uh, and this creates difficulties for us, and it also creates opportunities for us. Um, I think a particular difficulty will be that in the drafting of legislation uh, in Brussels, uh, we will be without the scrutiny which the British applied to legislation before it became legislation, which is when you really want to have a look at it. And I think this, this will be a particular difficulty for us in the, uh, in the coming times. Uh, but there will also be opportunities, and I think that's largely what you're, what you're going to address, is the opportunities which might exist uh, for this country uh, as the leading, as it were, the biggest uh, remaining uh, common law state uh, within the European Union. So you're most welcome to Justice. And if you'd like to yep. work from the podium, okay. that's okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> in a way, th this is a production that has... Um, come through a number of phases. It started off Broadway in Chicago in early September. Uh, it was relatively successful there and went on Broadway into the Fordham Law School, which if you know Fordham, it's almost on Broadway. And this is a kind of a Europeanized version, uh, adapted for an Irish audience by uh, getting rid of some of the kind of idiot's guide to Europe that's necessary to explain things uh, in America. Uh, and also perhaps, um, focusing less on technical legal issues. There is a paper which uh, will be available to those who really want to stay awake late at night, and there are two appendices to that that, that go into some of the legal, technical legal issues in greater detail, but I hope not to go through those at this stage. I also felt when I was beginning to adjust the uh, original American papers that there might be greater clarity about precisely what we were talking about in the context of Brexit by the time I got to deliver this today, but unfortunately I don't think that's so. There's obviously the development of there now being a draft withdrawal agreement, but whether that goes through is obviously open to doubt, and if it doesn't go through, what happens, or even if it does go through, what happens so far as the issues with which we're concerned also remains open to doubt. Um, <clears throat> If I were to go through the whole paper, it would probably take too long, so I propose to speak to it and to deal with the general themes that are addressed in it. And as Di rightly said, the ultimate concentration is on opportunities, but I think before we get to opportunities, there are a few building blocks that are necessary to identify the challenges and also why there might be opportunities. Uh, I suppose the starting point has to be to acknowledge that since uh, Ireland joined the then European Economic Community in 1973, um, the reach of European Union law into the legal systems of all of the member states has grown to a very significant extent. And I think it would be fair now to say that almost all practicing lawyers, regulators, public officials and courts uh, are affected to frequently a significant extent by issues of European Union law. And to the extent that European Union law has now become intertwined to a large extent with the legal systems of the member states. And it's that very enmeshment of European Union law that makes the disentanglement required by Brexit all the more pro problematic. And I would think even in areas that are not particularly controversial in themselves, but nonetheless require agreement. Um, I obviously focus on the challenges and opportunities for the Irish legal system arising out of Brexit. Uh, and I do suggest that Ireland does have uh, significant opportunities, but they're ones 
which won't happen automatically uh, and which require careful work and consideration uh, before they can be exploited. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think it is fair to say that from a general perspective, no one thinks that Brexit is positive. Um, but insofar as there are negative areas, the aim has to be to attempt to mitigate them, but also to identify areas where there may be opportunities and to exploit those as best they can. And I think international dispute resolution is certainly an area where there are potentially opportunities for Ireland. Um, <clears throat> I think we need to start with uh, some explanation of the instruments of judicial cooperation uh, which have been developed by the European Union uh, over the last perhaps 20-25 years and which advantage at the moment the United Kingdom uh, but may be capable of being used to our advantage post-Brexit. Um, <clears throat> I think it is important to emphasise that uh, historically much of trans-border litigation or other forms of dispute resolution, including arbitration in trans-border insolvency, were governed by what were known as the principles of private international law. And for the benefit of non-lawyers, public international law is the law relating to treaties and relations between states. Private international law is concerned uh, with things like the decision as to which courts are to have jurisdiction, which courts recognise the decisions of other courts, what law is to be applied. And the Irish law in that area was largely based on the UK common law, and similar principles apply in the United States and many other countries that are in that tradition. But increasingly over the years, uh, much of this area of law was codified in European Union law in matters such as the Brussels regulation, uh, the Rome uh, regulation and the like, uh, so that there is now a body of European Union law that governs decisions in most areas and certainly in the kind of areas that are likely to be the subject of international litigation. Uh, decide which country should have jurisdiction, what law should be applied, what level of recognition should there be, when should countries cede jurisdiction uh, to another country. Uh, and it is, I think that codified set of laws and its potential application or not application to the United Kingdom post-Brexit that really is at the core of the questions which I want to address today. But I want to start with a little bit of background concerning what actually, from a legal perspective, Brexit actually is. Uh, I suppose everyone now knows that it's governed by Article 50 because we keep hearing about the Article 50 notice. But I, I think it is important just to pause to look at what that article actually does. Um, article 50, sub-article 2, requires a member state who decides to withdraw, and that's the term that's used, uh, to notify the European Council of its intention. And as we all know, the United Kingdom did that on the 29th of March 2017. The uh, Article 50.3 provides that the treaties, it's the European Union treaties, cease to apply to that state, the withdrawing state, either when a withdrawal agreement comes into force or in the absence of a withdrawal agreement two years after the notification. So strictly speaking, it could happen in less than two years. It's not that you automatically leave in two years. If there happened to be a quicker withdrawal agreement which came into force earlier, it could have happened in less than two years, but that obviously isn't going to happen at this stage. The height of what might happen is that there's a withdrawal agreement that will come into force on the second anniversary, being the 29th of March of next year. But it is important to note what that article says. It says that the treaty shall cease to apply to the state in question from that date or failing, from the date of the withdrawal agreement, or failing that, two years after the notification referred to. So what happens is the treaties cease to have effect. European Union law stops having effect uh, in the withdrawal state on the, the second anniversary, subject to whatever it may be in a withdrawal agreement. So if we're talking about so-called no-deal Brexit, 
of many consequences, economic, political, and the like, but from a legal perspective, a no-deal Brexit, meaning a Brexit where there is no withdrawal agreement in place by the 29th of March of next year, means simply that the treaties cease to apply to the United Kingdom. It ceases for our purposes and the purposes of the other 27 to be a member, and therefore European Union law treats the United Kingdom as if it was no different to any other uh, third-party country, the same as the United States, Australia, Nigeria, or anywhere else. And there may be <coughs> matters such as WTO that, that has application, but, but nonetheless, in the absence of a withdrawal agreement, there is no formal legal relationship uh, between, uh, of a European Union nature between uh, the remaining states and the withdrawing states. Uh, and indeed, this is confirmed, I think, in a recent communication from the European Commission, which says <clears throat> that if the withdrawal agreement is ratified before the 30th of March 2019, so that it can enter into, into force on that day, uh, EU law will cease to apply to and in the United Kingdom on the, at the end of the transition period agreed, which was envisaged, and I think still is envisaged, at least initially, to be for 21 months. So the first kind of fork in the road, as it were, is that on the 29th of March, we either will have a withdrawal agreement or we won't. If we don't have a withdrawal agreement, the treaty cease to apply as of that day to the UK. If there is a withdrawal agreement in its current form or in anything remotely like it, then in, for practical purposes, uh, so far as the legal issues are concerned, uh, the treaties will continue to apply during what's come to be known as the transition period uh, up to either the, uh, <coughs> the end of 2020 or perhaps given that there's an extension provision built into the current draft of the withdrawal agreement for some period after that. So I suppose that from a legal point of view and looking at challenges and opportunities, uh, we, we are looking at two key points. One is, do we have a withdrawal agreement uh, by next March? If no, then simply e EU law ceases to apply to the UK. I if yes, then there are further negotiations during a transition period. And at the end of that, we then have an unclear situation because what happens then depends on the nature of the uh, agreement entered into. There is an aspiration uh, in the political documents accompanying the withdrawal draft at the moment that there will be negotiated a high level of cooperation in, amongst other things, uh, civil and judicial uh, matters. So there's an intention that there would be some sort of a deal governing the, uh, the legal relations uh, of the type I'm discussing post uh, the end of the transition period. But precisely what the nature of that is going to be uh, is something that I think remains open to some doubt. And one of the things I want to, to deal with is to point out that there are difficulties in relation to precisely replicating the current suite of arrangements between the UK as a member of the EU and the remaining states in a post-Brexit uh, situation. Um, so that uncertainty is also something perhaps to mark because uh, it's something I want to come back to as a relevant factor in the opportunities uh, that, that Ireland has at the moment. The other building block, of course, to this is, as Dahi said, that Ireland is a common law system and will, I think it's fair to say, post-Brexit, be the only fully common law system. Essentially, there are four current members of the EU which are to a greater or lesser extent in the common law fold. Ireland and the UK are two. Cyprus uh, is a jurisdiction where its private law is largely uh, derived from the common law, although much of it has now been codified. But its public law, in other words, the law relating to challenges to government, executive, and similar decisions is based uh, to a significant extent on the French Code Napoleon. So it's sort of half and half common law and civil law. Uh, and it's, of course, a lot smaller than we are. Cyprus is about a million people. Malta is also partly a common law country, smaller again at about half a million. And curiously, it's the other way around to Cyprus. Its uh, public law is common law, and its private law is based on uh, the French system. 
I think in both cases, perhaps largely reflecting different historical experience with who happen to be the occupying powers at different parts of, of their recent legal history. So essentially, post-Brexit, we are left as by far the largest common law country, even though we're obviously very small, and the only country that is fully common law. And that brings with it um, many challenges, but also perhaps gives rise to the opportunities to which I will shortly turn. Um, Gerard Hogan, now Advocate General at the Court of Justice, in a recent paper, um, I think expressed somewhat pessimistic views about uh, the ability to maintain a, a common law voice post the departure of the United Kingdom. Um, I don't doubt the very significant challenges that exist. I would take a slightly more optimistic view uh, than Gerard Hogan takes, but I suppose this is one of those issues where the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. But the one thing that is, I think, absolutely essential is that for Ireland to retain uh, uh, its status as truly being a common law country uh, will require effort on our part. Um, there is risk that with the departure of the United Kingdom, European legislation, perhaps even European case law, will increasingly ignore the alternative common law position. And I think that's a particular risk if we don't, as it were, mind the shop uh, as the largest remaining uh, common law country. Um, it, it, it is worth perhaps reflecting on the fact that uh, our, the Irish Supreme Court um, is a member of three Europe-wide Supreme Court bodies. And you might ask, why are we a member of three bodies? Well, many European countries have very different court structures to ours. In most countries uh, in the civil law system, there is a separate constitutional court or tribunal, uh, which is separate from what we might call the ordinary Supreme Court, whereas typically in common law systems here, the US, Canada, and the like, the same Supreme Court carries out both roles. Also, in a majority, but not all, civil law countries, public law, judicial review and the like, is dealt with in an entirely separate stream of courts with their own Supreme Court. Or in some countries, applying a French model, a Conseil d'État, uh, which acts partly as an advisory body on legislation, but also as the final court uh, for um, public law matters. Um, and each of those streams has its own grouping uh, which come together to discuss matters of mutual interest. But in my experience, I've been involved in one of them for about five years and in all of them since I became Ch Chief Justice last year. Um, <clears throat> they are increasingly being consulted by the Commission uh, on issues uh, concerning legal developments, possible future legal developments, legislation, as was mentioned earlier. And while there are many strands that feed into the ultimate text of legislation that goes through, and it's very important that the Irish voice is heard in all of those strands. I, I think it is the case uh, that increasingly the Commission wants to consult with the, the bodies representative of the uh, Supreme Courts throughout Europe uh, as part of the process of attempting to improve the quality of legislation. And in that context, it's interesting to note uh, a program uh, promoted by the Vice President of the Commission, Timmermans, called Better Regulation. And that program has been put in place in conjunction with the Association of Supreme Administrative Courts of the EU, a body called ACA by its acronym. Um, and the purpose of that program in a pilot scheme is to identify areas of legislation that are not working. Um, not issues of policy, not issues where one mightn't agree with the legislation, but rather where on a nuts and bolts basis the legislation doesn't seem to be doing what it's meant to do. Uh, and obviously, and perhaps it's a bigger point to make in America because their system is different, but obviously the day-to-day -day implementation of European law in Europe is done in national courts. We don't, unlike the United States, have federal courts in each area. So the Irish High Court or the High Court in, in England or the Cour de Cassation in France or whatever is applying on a regular basis. European Union law, and it's therefore those coalface courts that are able to identify problems in legislation and put forward technical solutions uh, f for those problems. 
And this pilot scheme, as I say, being run with the, on the initiative of the Vice President of the Commission, I think is an example of how the Commission is looking to the coalface courts to, for help in identifying problems with, with legislation. And perhaps in the future may even seek to consult uh, in advance of legislation. So while I don't think courts themselves would be by any manner of means the sole input into legislation, clearly there are other bodies much closer uh, to the process of crafting uh, legislation both uh, in the Council and in the Parliament, nonetheless I think courts will play a significant role. Uh, and there's a similar uh, project um, being undertaken by the European Association of Judges, which is called Ways to Brussels, which has similar ends. But the purpose of mentioning these is to give my own experience of these bodies, which is that they frequently do want a common law voice on their working groups and committees. Uh, it's my experience that they always do. Uh, I've been involved with the ACA body for perhaps five or six years now, and every time they, want, they set up a working group or a subcommittee, they want a common law voice on it. And we have probably, as we often do in Europe, punched above our weight and been more regularly represented than the UK, perhaps because we're a bit more active in European matters. But I suspect virtually the entire burden of supplying members for such bodies in the future is going to fall upon us. And that is a burden uh, on both a small country and also a country where, in common with the common law tradition, the number of judges in the higher courts is much smaller. I mean, typically, Supreme Courts in uh, civil law countries have 30, 40, 50, upwards of 100 members divided into chambers dealing with different specializations. The Irish Supreme Court is not unusual in its size in the common law world, having at the moment uh, eight members. Uh, but supplying people to attend, to have an Irish voice at the table, uh, is, I think, uh, going to be a challenge to us, uh, but one which we're willing to undertake. But I would agree with Jared Hogan that there is a danger, and this, I suppose, is the last point I want to make before getting on to the opportunities. There is a danger that if the common law voice is not heard at those tables, whether it's uh, civil servants uh, crafting legislation, draft people uh, producing the legislation, judges or others being consulted on the legislation, if there isn't a common law voice at the table, then there is a real risk that uh, unintended consequences will flow from legislation being drafted by those from a different legal tradition who wouldn't necessarily understand that it might not fit easily uh, into a common law system. Uh, and that, I would see, is one of the great dangers from our point of view. Uh, we've had experience in the past, perhaps, of some types of legislation that have not fitted easily in, in, into the Irish model. A lot of our environmental legislation, for example, has caused major trouble over, over recent years. And I think partly it's because we didn't work out at an early stage in a very clear way how best European legislation was to fit into a common law system. And I think the UK have had not dissimilar difficulties in some areas. So that's the starting point, I suppose, to, to have the opportunities. Ireland has to remain a common law country and it has to be the case that the common law can survive within the boundaries of an EU without the UK. That's not a given, I think. But it is something that can be done. My perception is that there is a willingness to accommodate the common law voice, but that willingness has to be accompanied by a preparedness on our part to be able to voice that voice, to be at the table, so that voice can be expressed. So where then do the opportunities come from? Well, the UK, I think it's fair to say, has built up a very significant position as a major centre for international dispute resolution. And there are many reasons for that, but I think one of the biggest reasons for it uh, is to be found in the fact that for countries outside the EU, the UK, uh, particularly America, Canada and other countries in the common law world, uh, the UK uh, has a familiar legal system. And it is interesting that while 
Obviously, from a continental perspective, the common law is relatively scarce, having only four countries. In much of the rest of the world, there is a desire to accommodate uh, common law forms of litigation. It's very interesting if you go to Dubai, uh, that Dubai has a parallel system of courts called the DIFC courts, uh, connected with the Dubai International Financial Services Center, so that parties can opt in to going to a common law court in Dubai rather than going through the ordinary uh, Sharia courts uh, of the Emirates. And why do they have that? And other similar ex uh, experiments have taken place in other Middle Eastern countries. I think the answer is simple. It is because the kind of companies that are doing business there want to be able to litigate in a legal system with which they're familiar. So I think that's the starting point. There is an appetite for, for major international corporations. Uh, obviously, they like to avoid litigation in the first place, but if they are faced with litigation, uh, they would like, if possible, that that litigation can be conducted through a legal process with which they're familiar. And I think that gives an appetite for a common law dispute resolution system. Of course, the other great advantage the UK had was the whole series of European Union uh, measures which provide that the orders of European Union courts, provided they comply with the requirements of the various uh, regulations, travel throughout the entire EU. You have the Brussels uh, one recast uh, regulation, which sets out uniform rules to determine questions of jurisdiction, and also provides for the recognition and enforcement of judges of a member state court in another member state where the judgment of the court which is to be recognized is the correct court so far as the, the regulation is concerned. Uh, there are also choice of law provisions to be found in, in the Rome regulations and also there is an insolvency regulation which provides for determining which courts juris or which countries courts are to have principal or central jurisdiction over cross-border insolvencies. <coughs> and in my judgment, the UK has greatly benefited by the fact that it is both within the common law world and therefore has a familiar litigation system to many outside, but also uh, can exploit, as it were, uh, these cross-European measures so that decisions of the UK courts in many cases uh, carry throughout the European Union. Um, earlier this year, I attended a, a conference of an international body which represents insolvency practitioners called INSOL, uh, which took place in New York in the spring, mainly solicitors and accountants who are heavily involved in international insolvency. Um, the consensus there, I think, firstly, was that the factors I've just identified uh, were central to the UK having become a major center uh, for the resolution of international insolvency issues. Um, the European Union regulation, the insolvency regulation, um, provides that the courts of the country where a company has its so-called center of main interest, COMI or COMI, are to have prim the primary role in determining how to organize what are often very complex issues of uh, interlocking companies in different jurisdictions, assets in different jurisdictions, different legal systems applying, for example, to workers' rights and the like. And the whole point behind the insolvency regulation was that there should be one country that would be in charge, its rules would run throughout the European Union, but there might be secondary insolvency proceedings in other countries to sort out, as it were, local issues. Um, most senior insolvency practitioners will tell you that given a reasonable amount of time and effort, and time is about 18 months, they would say, they can probably get Comey to go nearly anywhere you want. So if you decide today that you would like your, you see an insolvency coming down the road, you're going to have to reorganize your company, you're in debt, and you decide you want to use the UK system, 
and you set about doing it today, you can reorganize things so that Comey will be in the UK by the time you have to move uh, to, to bring your insolvency proceedings, and it will then be the UK courts that will decide it. So while in theory the regulation points to an objectively determined jurisdiction, the truth is people can adjust the criteria that, uh, by reference to which that objective decision is made and can, to, perhaps not completely, but to a significant, significant extent, choose the jurisdiction they want. And they have typically in, in Europe very frequently chosen the United Kingdom, which has an effective corporate reorganization system called administration and also has a schemes of, of arrangement model, which also allows for the reorganization of uh, international companies. Um, we too have similar models, not identical. The examinership model in Ireland is perhaps closer to the American Chapter 11 than the UK administration model. Um, one could go on for a long time about the differences between them, but I think it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But we also have the same almost identical schemes of arrangement um, measures in our Companies Act uh, as the UK ha have in theirs. So the legal tools that Ireland has are every bit as good as the UK. But obviously, in the past, the UK was bigger. It was much more likely to be the centre of uh, international insolvency litigation because the orders of the UK courts travelled throughout the entire European Union. But post-Brexit, it is most unlikely that that will continue. Precisely what arrangements might be entered into between the EU and uh, the UK remain open to doubt. But I find it difficult to see, and I didn't find too many insolvency practitioners who felt that it was likely that arrangements could be made that would give the UK the kind of access uh, to orders that would travel throughout the European Union as they enjoy today. It's a bit like the passporting and finance. So there's limits to how far the European Union is likely to go, particularly if the UK is not prepared to sign up to the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. And that seems to be one of the red lines that uh, is not being breached at the moment. So I think that's a good example of where an opportunity can come. We have the tools in Ireland. Uh, we probably weren't able to exploit them because the UK had them as well, and they're a lot bigger than those. But post-Brexit, we will remain a common law jurisdiction. Uh, and for cases such as those major uh, cross-border insolvencies, we can offer uh, a country which has the same legal measures available, but which will retain uh, uh, orders which will be enforceable uh, throughout the European Union. And similar provisions, I think, apply in relation to other forms of litigation and other forms of dispute resolution, such as arbitration. We have a very modern uh, arbitration law in Ireland, pretty well completely adopting the Unsertrau model law, um, <clears throat> which again has its attractions. And being within the European Union and having orders that are therefore enforceable throughout the European Union uh, is, I think, potentially a very major advantage to, uh, to Ireland. So I suppose the reason why I think there are opportunities for Ireland comes from an analysis of why the UK has done well. Somebody suggested to me, and it's only anecdotal, but that the, they felt that the total business done over the last 15 to 20 years in the UK, um, legal business, um, because of the UK's position within the European Union, and as a, a, a good place for international dispute resolution uh, for that reason, was probably of the order of a billion uh, pounds sterling a year. Uh, it wouldn't take a great share of that to come to Ireland for that to be a significant benefit uh, to, to Ireland. And of course, there isn't really a downside to it. It, it. This is equivalent to an internationally traded service. Uh, this work is going to be done somewhere. If it's done in Ireland, whether by Irish lawyers or others, or perhaps a mix, uh, it's going to bring income to Ireland, which wouldn't otherwise come to Ireland, uh, for no great cost. So it seems to me that this is an opportunity that we certainly need to look at. Um, it is, I think, however, important also to acknowledge that there are challenges in even that opportunity. Um, we are not the only show in town. There are others who are interested in 
uh, benefiting from what they see is the likely reduction in the UK's share of this type of international dispute resolution. Uh, and that's hardly surprising given the scale of what's at stake. Very interestingly, the Paris Commercial Court has now established a division which allows parties to plead both in writing and uh, orally in English. The idea that the French have gone so far as to allow quel dommage, English to be used in their courts as a means of communication is, I think, an interesting uh, uh, sign of how interested in uh, g gaining their share of the work uh, they are. Uh, also, the Dutch are considering setting up courts that will be friendly, and also the Germans, that will be friendly to the type of litigation uh, about which I speak. So there is no doubt that uh, we, we have competitors for this market. I think the fact that we are a common law country and provided we can retain a significant common law flag within the EU gives us an advantage that no one else has. Um, I was speaking a uh, week before last to the chairman of a major American law firm who was visiting Ireland because they'd set up an Irish branch. Um, and I asked him why was it that they frequently advised their clients who had transnational business involving Europe uh, to enter into contracts that chose the UK as uh, the, the jurisdiction in which litigation was to be held and chose the U UK law as the law to be applied. And he said, really, it's simple. They speak the same language as us. They have a legal system and a litigation system with which we're familiar, and they're part of the EU. So why wouldn't you? But they were concerned, and the reason why they were interested in Ireland, and the reason why he was here, is they're concerned about whether that makes sense in two or three years' time, when some of those advantages are, are, are going to disappear. I'm not suggesting for a moment that the UK is suddenly going to lose all of its international dis dispute resolution work. They have great expertise. They're bound to retain a significant amount of it. But there certainly are concerns uh, on the part of those who might be involved in international litigation that losing automatic recognition throughout the European Union is a significant matter. And that's why they are looking for alternatives. It's very interesting that the um, body representative of those who are engaged in international swaps and derivatives um, traditionally had three forms of standard contract. This is sort of esoteric financial instruments that some people understand. I don't claim to be one of them. Uh, but they can involve a lot of money, and there is often litigation arising out of them. Um, historically, they had a New York law version, they had a UK law version, and they had a Japanese law version. And perhaps just to take one step back, most of the time contracting parties are free to agree the jurisdiction in which any litigation arising out of the contract will take place, and are free within significant limits uh, to agree what law is to apply. So you can have choice of law, choice of jurisdiction clauses. So you can have a standard contract that says UK law is going to apply and if there's a dispute it's going to be litigated in the UK courts. Or alternatively in New York and because America is treated as 50 different countries for these purposes it has to be an individual state uh, rather than, the, than uh, the US as a whole. Very interestingly that very substantial international body has now added two new standard forms to their repertoire. One is an Irish jurisdiction, Irish law, Irish choice of law version and the second is a French. Now, I would assume they don't do that for fun. They do it because that is a choice that some of their members may wish to exercise. And my understanding would be that the reason why they feel that choice might be exercised, at least by some in favour of Ireland, is there will be those who will wish to continue to litigate in a common law country through a common law litigation system, but do so in a country which is within the EU and whose orders will automatically uh, be enforced throughout the EU. I think there are other challenges which we face, however. Um, one would hear on the grapevine that our competitors are um, putting it about that we don't have the capacity to deal with the significantly increased volume of international uh, litigation. And being realistic, no country, and particularly no small country, has an unlimited ability 
if we were to quadruple the volume of significant complex commercial litigation in Ireland, we probably would struggle uh, to deal with it. But I think it is fair to say that certainly up to now, the Dublin Commercial Court has enjoyed uh, a significant international reputation. Speaking to judges from the European Court, I know that the Irish Bar uh, would be regarded by them along with the UK as among the most uh, impressive of the litigators that they come across. So I, I don't think we lack, uh, both in the courts and in those who might appear in the courts, uh, people who would be well able uh, to do the job. Um, it would be necessary, I think, if there was any significant growth in the amount of uh, international litigation finding its way to Ireland, uh, that there would be additional judges appointed, uh, and not just to make up the numbers, as it were, but also judges with sufficient backup to enable them to do the work. Uh, and also, I think it does have to be said, and even though this is trespassing a little close to controversial areas, that both the method of selection of those judges and the terms and conditions that might be offered to them would have to be sufficient that they could attract the kind of people who would retain that reputation. Um, it's all, be all very well saying, well, we're common law, we speak English, and we're in the European Union, but if people don't think our courts are up to the job, then the work isn't going to come to Ireland. The UK courts have that high reputation. I think we also have it. But if we're to retain it, particularly in the context of an increased volume, then we need to make sure that we are able to appoint people of suitable quality uh, to be able to conduct that litigation in the courts. And that is potentially a, a challenge, but I think it's one that is uh, capable of being met. And certainly the impression I get from government is that they are aware of that challenge and the need to meet it if this is to be an area in, in which we are uh, going to be able to exploit the opportunities which arise. And I might just add on the sort of <coughs> are we up to it side of the uh, question, um, an anecdotal uh, account of what was said to me by a number of English insolvency practitioners um, at the conference to which I referred, and it really was something that was one of my take-home points from that conference. Um, obviously, they'd prefer not to lose the work. They like it. They get well paid for it. They'd like to keep it. Um, but I think, certainly so far as the individuals are concerned, if it was to go, or to the extent that it might go, they very much preferred it to come to Ireland rather than, say, France or Germany or Holland. This was not out of good old-fashioned love the paddies or anything like that, but rather from a narrow, self-interested point of view, the ease of transition between the relevant professions in Ireland and the UK, long before we were ever members of the EU, w w was very straightforward. The same large accountancy firms that provide the accountants in the major insolvency uh, transborder uh, cases uh, operate in all jurisdictions. In fact, they frequently send people cross borders anyway. Uh, if there's need for particular expertise in the Irish office dealing with a particular type of, of insolvency, you may well find a senior uh, person from the office in London of the same major accountancy firm uh, coming over to Ireland for six months. So, in terms of having the personnel available to manage a large amount of, uh, a, a, a largely increased amount of complex litigation, I think insofar as we can't supply it directly ourselves, there is ease of transition. Solicitors, barristers can very easily transfer from Ireland to England. Um, one of my jobs is to call people to the bar. Um, it's interesting that in the call this year, out of a total call of approximately 130, um, almost 40 were London lawyers uh, taking up their entitlement to also become Dublin lawyers. I don't suspect most of them are going to turn up in the law library tomorrow looking to do personal injury work. I suspect they want to have the badge so that they are EU lawyers post-Brexit. But it does demonstrate that you know, we are, I think, capable of handling a, a significantly increased uh, volume of litigation uh, of one sort or another if it comes our way. So, uh, the co in conclusion, what I would say is that there are challenges <coughs> which Brexit is likely to create for Ireland in ensuring <laughs> that the common law voice, including the particularly Irish position, is effectively represented at EU level. 
But I think our status as a common law, English-speaking EU member state, with an effective court system, a highly regarded legal profession and judiciary, uh, with a well-respected international reputation, has the potential to place us uh, as a hub for dispute resolution uh, in the EU after Brexit. Um, I, I think that we have in those factors something that is unique to us. We will have challengers. I think it's almost inevitable that the UK will lose some of their position. And it's almost inevitable that all of the work lost by the UK will not end up in one place. But we have some unique characteristics which allow us to be well placed uh, to fight our corner in obtaining a share of that which may, lose, uh, may be lost uh, by the UK. And I think, at least in some respects, we have a series of advantages that no other country shares. No one else can combine being in the EU, operating a common law system, speaking English, and having courts that are used to dealing with these kind of disputes. Uh, and that's perhaps the last point I'd make. Um, there have been significant uh, international uh, cases run in the Irish Commercial Court in recent years, and I don't think it lacked the competence to deal with them. There have been a whole series of cases, for example, uh, arising out of the collapse of the Madoff Empire, which have run in the Irish courts. And very interestingly, uh, I was involved in some of them as a High Court judge in the Commercial Court, and very interestingly, in one case we were involved in, there was a parallel proceedings running in the federal courts in the US in the so-called Southern District of New York, which, is, which covers Manhattan, therefore covers Wall Street, <coughs> and is therefore the court that tends to deal with Wall Street uh, litigation, uh, which uh, operates at the federal level. And interestingly, the, the US courts ceded jurisdiction to the Irish courts. As a result of an application made in the US courts, uh, the US federal court decided that Ireland was a better place for that litigation to run because we were more closely connected with it. But I think that's a sign of the reputation which the Irish courts have as well, uh, that there was no question that the case would not be as well run in Ireland as it might be in the US, uh, that the US corporations would get as much justice or as little as they deserve uh, in the Irish courts as they would in their home courts, um, and that there was no problem in the case being run in Ireland as opposed to the US provided Ireland was more closely associated, the witnesses were here, and the like. I think that is an example of the reputation we have. I think that reputation gives us the opportunities which I speak of, but they are opportunities and no more. To convert them into reality, then there are challenges that need to be met, and perhaps now is the time that we need to start thinking about putting in place the building blocks to ensure that we are able to exploit those opportunities. Thank you very much.